It's a pleasure to introduce Florian Erhardt from the University of Zurich. He's a junior professor here and a group leader within the Institute for Immunobiology and Virology. And Florian has been really amazingly working really hard to integrate uh, uh, temporal resolution with the transcriptomic data and single cell data. And um, also, I want just to say that Florian is really a fantastic colleague to work with every day. So uh, we'll be we're more than happy to have you here. And we're really excited to hear your, your talk, Florian, especially on virus infected SARS, which is really, really an important topic today. OK, thanks, Emmanuel, for this very flattering introduction. It is really a pleasure for me uh, to present you in this fantastic workshop and to kick off the session on metabolic RNA labeling. In my talk, I will tell you about virus infection in single cells and why metabolic RNA labeling is so important for investigating that. I will also talk a little bit about the computational approaches that we have developed for it and about some caveats to consider when using metabolic RNA labeling. So to explain what I mean by my title and also by the picture that I had on the previous slide, what I find really interesting about virus infection is that even for cultured cells, they are by all means very homogeneous. If they are infected with some virus, the outcome of the infection is highly heterogeneous. So taken to the extreme, this can mean that some cells are able to defend themselves against the infection, whereas others are rapidly transformed into virus producing factories. And what's not really my interest here is, what is the reason for that? What are the factors that lead to these highly heterogeneous outcomes of infection? So first we thought that single cell RNA sequencing is the perfect method for investigating that. However, it suffers from a limitation that I would like to demonstrate with an example. This is data that we obtained in collaboration with Emmanuel and Ulrich Kalinke. The data set contains dendritic cells that were infected with cytomegalovirus and also a number of control cells that were not infected, as shown here. If we know, now look at the total percentage of viral gene expression in all these cells, we see that only a minor fraction of the infected cells actually is productively infected and show clear signs of viral gene expression. Again, what you would like to know is what, what was the difference for these cells as compared to all the other cells that were infected at the time of infection? And this now really shows the problem. For all these cells, we know about the infection outcome, but what we do not know is what they were like eight hours earlier. This is because the infection and the cytokines produced by these cells cause massive changes in the regulatory programs of all these cells. For all these other cells, we know what they are like without virus, obviously, but there is of course no way to tell how they would turn out to be once infected. So the limitation is that single cell RNA seq only provides a single snapshot of gene expression. But what we need to what we need to infer what is important for the infection outcome is basically two snapshots before and after infection, and this for the very same cells. So the solution to this problem is of course metabolic RNA labeling. And because I'm the first one, I'm going to introduce this shortly to you. So for that nucleoside analogs such as for thyuridin, for SU, are added to the cells. They take it up and then incorporate this in place of normal uridins into newly synthesized RNAs. This means that after a short labeling pulse of, for instance, two hours, we have two kinds of RNA in our cells. A pre-existing RNA or old RNA that does not contain 4SU and the one synthesized during these two hours which contain 4SU. Then, and this is particular to this protocol, it is called SLAMSeq. There are also alternatives to that. In the extracted RNA, specifically 4SU is converted chemically into a cytosine analog. When then cDNA is made, we have the C in places of Ts in exactly these sites where 4SU had been incorporated. So in principle, if we did now RNA-seq and have our reads for a gene is schematically shown here, we only, only have to look for T to C mismatches and count the corresponding reads. And then we know how much old and how much new RNA was there for this gene. Well, unfortunately, it is not as easy as that. 
And the main reason for that is that 4SU in cooperation is actually quite limited. It is only one in 40 to 50 U's that are substituted by 4SU. This means that in addition to these reads that you would actually like to see, there are also many reads that look like that. So they originate from newly synthesized RNA, but just by chance, they do not cover any site of 4SU incorporation. And therefore they do not have these characteristic mismatches. And these can actually by, be quite many. So if you simply count reads with T to C mismatches for measuring the, to the newly synthesized RNA, you would dramatically underestimate the total amount of new RNA. And to make things even worse, there are of course sequencing errors that also cause T to C mismatches also in reads coming from old RNAs. So this quantification problem really needed to be solved before applying this to our original question and to single cell RNA sequencing. Our approach is based on first estimating these two parameters, P old and P new, which are the probabilities of having a mismatch in old RNA and in new RNA. And then use these two parameters to estimate the mixture coefficient of a binomial mixture model. By doing this, we probabilistically basically distribute reads to old and new RNA in a way that both the sequencing errors and the limited 4SU incorporation is satisfied. This mixture coefficient is the new to total RNA ratio, the NTR. And this is estimated in a Bayesian framework which gives us access also to the full posterior distribution, which is very important for filtering the genes that cannot be quantified accurately. This is implemented in our tool that is called Grand Slam, and this tool is now used by many groups to analyze their SLAMSEQ data. Now, before I come to our single cell data, I wanted to point out um, one more thing. It's important to check the force U conditions before you conduct a major experiment. So this is data from human fibroblasts that we treated with two high concentrations of 4SU. So this experiment failed miserably. And I will tell you how we saw that. These are the changes between a sample containing, also with 4SU, and a 4SU naive sample plotted against the gene-specific RNA half-life. Obviously, and what you see here, genes with short-lived RNAs are much weaker expressed in the presence of 4SU which indicates that transcription is defective or even shuts down in the sample. What we now generally do with new cell types before doing a read experiment, we treat them with increasing concentrations of 4SU and do a small scale slam seed experiment. This is data from three cell lines that we treated with 100, 200, 400, 800 micromolar concentrations of 4SU. In the orange cell line, you can see that there is this toxicity effect starting with 800 micromolar. So this should be avoided. I believe it is really necessary to do the sequencing here, so to do really SLAMSeq, because at the same time, it is important to know what the sample specific P new value is. So this is basically the probability for a T to C in new RNA. If this is too small, for instance, less than 2%, it won't be possible to quantify old and new, and new RNA precisely. And in the end, this would mean that the posterior distributions that we get will become extremely wide for most of the genes. Okay, but now let's, a look, have, now let's have a look at our data that we obtained for analyzing our virus infection. We infected mouse fibroblasts with cytomegalovirus, started labeling at the same time and harvested the RNA two hours later. After Grand Slam analysis, we got for each cellular gene, old and new RNA, which tell us about the state of of each cell prior to infection and to its response to infection. For the infected cells, we also got new viral RNA corresponding to the infection efficiency per cell. And what we also observed was unlabeled viral RNA. And this is because cytomegalovirus particles, these things here, also contain a lot of mRNAs from their previous host cells. And this is of course not labeled. And we can use, use this total amount of unlabeled viral RNA as a proxy for the dose of infection, because the more of these unlabeled RNAs we have, the more virus particles enter the cell. Now let's have a look at a couple of analyses that we did for these data. The first is what my former PhD advisor would have called the litmus test. 
this is something that has to work, otherwise we are in trouble, but at least we know we are in trouble. Here, this is to look at a set of genes that is known to be transcriptionally regulated, induced. And in this case, this is interference stimulated genes or ISGs. These are shown here in these two heat maps, one for the new RNA, one for the old RNA. Because they are transcriptionally induced, we should see a strong difference of infected versus the, uh, of uninfected versus the infected cells, which is exactly what we see here. And we should see this only in new RNA. This is basically the positive check. We expect something to see and we indeed see it. Even more, we even see a dose dependency effect. The more viral gene, ex the more, sorry, the more viral reads we have in a cell, the more regulation takes place. This can also be quantified and is highly significant. Importantly, we also see basal expression in uninfected cells, at least for some of the ISGs, which is not unexpected. It is therefore not surprising that we also see old RNA in all the cells. Importantly, however, there are no differences between the uninfected and the infected cells. And there's also no correlation with viral gene expression. And this is basically the negative check. We should not see it and we don't. I believe that having such a possibility to do such checks is really important to rule out that there are unexpected problems with the data. Another check is shown here. These are six principal component analyses. Um, these are done spe uh, specifically on genes that are known to be regulated and either for regulated genes with short RNA half-life or with long RNA half-life. The left column shows the PCA done on total RNA. So this is basically what you would get without metabolic labeling. The middle shows old RNA and the right shows new RNA. You see a separation of the uninfected and the infected cells only in these three PCAs. For genes with short-lived RNAs, you see a difference already in total RNA, but not for the long-lived RNAs. And the reason for that is of course that all these changes that actually have happened are simply masked by the pre-existing RNA that is still there after two hours. In old RNA, you see no difference in any case, that's good. And in new RNA, you see a clear separation for both the short-lived and the long-lived RNAs. Now next, we identified differentially regulated genes for uninfected and versus infected cells, of course. Again, most of the gene expression changes can only be detected when considering new RNA, but not in total RNA. Something similar can again be observed when moving from the single gene analysis towards gene set analysis. And here we use this to infer which transcription factors were activated um, upon the infection. And this is done by looking for an enrichment of the target genes of each transcription factor among the regulated genes. When we did this with total RNA, no transcription factor came out as being significant. However, on the level of new RNA, we identif identified the very three things we would expect from CMV infected cells. And that is an activation of IRFs of nf kappa b and a signature of interference stimulated genes. That's basically the same thing that we have shown in this litmus test that I've shown to you. Our data also tell us a lot about the mode of regulation. So there are basically two ways how a gene can appear as being upregulated on the cell population scale. Either there is more gene expression in all the cells, or there are simply more cells that express this gene at all. For both modes, there are actually examples in our data. Here, the whole distribution is simply shifted, so stronger expression on all, this, on all the cells. Whereas for this gene, the overall distribution of cells that express this gene is unchanged. And this is really important here. It's just the percentage of cells that express it at all that changes at the same level as in uninfected cells. And this basically is the cause for this gene be, being upregulated. We can observe such cases also for downregulated genes. And on a global scale, this on and off mode of regulation was predominantly observed. And we believe that this is an efficient way for rapid responses and also strong responses of our cell intrinsic immune system without being prone to produce too much of the immune defense. So, so, so without being prone to overshooting. Now I hope this convinces you that our data tell us a lot about short-term changes of gene regulation. 
But what about this original goal that you had? Can we relate the state of each cell at the time of infection to the infection outcome? One factor that might be important is the infection dose per cell. As pointed out earlier, we can use unlabeled viral RNA for that. And this was strongly correlated to the infection efficiency, which indicates that the dose of infection is an important driver of the outcome of the infection, at least in the system. And this is basically the first example of a dose response analysis done in single cells. Another important factor could be the cell cycle for each cell. For human CMV, this has been shown earlier that cells that are in S phase cannot be infected very efficiently. And we could nicely recapitulate this finding. So in our data, we see that cells that were in G1 phase at the time of infection can be infected much more efficiently than, in, than cells in any other phase. Finally, and this is certainly the most interesting factor, we can use our data to identify pro and antiviral genes. So just by chance, and due to the heterogeneity of gene expression that you always observe, such genes might be expressed at very low levels in some cells and at very high levels in other cells. And this then might influence on the, inf on the, inf on the infection outcome. So this is the expression of a DNA binding protein that has first been described to inhibit HIV integration into the genome. And later also described for other viruses like vaccine and herpes simplex virus 1 to affect the infection efficiency. Here we see that the expression at time zero, so that's, that's the old RNA that is still there and was already there at the time of infection, is strongly anti-correlated with the infection efficiency, which means the stronger this gene was expressed, the less efficient was the infection. And this is really a strong indication that this gene also acts antivirally in our system. This way of analyzing perturbations is what we call heterogeneity sequencing. This basically exploit the heterogeneous gene expression in single cells, which so to say mimics a combined loss and gain of function screen and this at physiological levels. And we can use this to infer functional relationships of a variety of factors with some kind of perturbation like virus infection. So combining all these factors into a regression model like this um, is, is what we use to predict some, some dependent variable like the infection efficiency in, in this example. And in our case, it is important to factor out all these other strong but uninteresting effects like the dose of infection, also the sales cycle to increase the statistical power to find such antiviral genes. This is just one example here of another potential candidate of an antiviral gene. Directly, there is no significant correlation with the infection efficiency. However, when the residuals, um, after modeling the cell cycle and the infection um, dose are used, a weak correlation emerges. It is however important to mention that we are still working on these approaches in particular for analyzing newer data that we now have for thousands of infected cells, which will enable us to identify factors that also stay significant after we do the multiple testing correction that we have to do when we screen all the genes. So to sum this up, to investigate virus infection in single cells with the detail that I have shown, um, metabolic RNA labeling is absolutely required. It is not only important for resolving these short-term regulatory changes, but it also enables um, us to relate the state of each individual cell at the time of infection to its infection outcome. We believe that an absolute exciting opportunity here is to use these kinds of analysis that we call heterogeneity sequencing to generate hypotheses about host factors that determine the infection outcome. We'd also like to point out that this is of course not restricted to infection systems, but you can basically, in, investigate any kind of perturbation or dynamic process with that. And as it is already based on single cell RNA sequencing, it will also be straightforward to apply this to complex mixtures of cell types, uh, for instance, for analyzing common and specific um, cell type specific effects. In the end, I would like to thank, first of all, the members of my very small group, in particular, Chris Jürges, who was really instrumental in developing this Grand Slam approach. And I would also like to acknowledge my collaborators in this and actually many other projects, Lars and Emanuel. And I believe that this really shows how important it is that people with 
very different backgrounds, biology, single cell techniques, and um, bioinformatics, um, join up forces and work together on such projects. Also thanks to all the other collaborators who either contributed data that or analysis that I have shown or have not shown in the interest of time. There's one final thing I wanted to say. If you are looking for a job or if, you are, if you, or if you know someone who is looking for a PhD position, and if you're interested in these kinds of analysis in metabolic RNA labeling for virus infection, uh, there is a PhD positioning coming up in my group and I would ask you to apply. I think this is not only super exciting kind of work that can be done in a PhD, but um, for the candidate it would also be that he would be living in this beautiful city that you see here, which is Würzburg. So with that, I would like to thank you all for listening and I I'm looking forward to any questions that you have. Uh, thank you, Florian, that's really amazing. Uh, uh, questions? Are there anyone? So somebody is asking why do we all in Germany have A, A, G as abbreviation? We are not called all A, G, it's Arbeitsgruppe, so it's um. working group, so. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know what, what is what is actually the, the 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 English equivalent of that. I don't know. Yes, <laughs> Fabian, you want to ask a question? Yeah, th thanks, thanks for 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 nice presentation. I'm of course asking if there's some sort of computational challenges from let's say maybe differential comparison or something like that. So do you deal with the metabolically labeled RNAs versus the the, the, the total ones just as another modality? I think in your case, it's a matched modality, right? Yes. That's so true. differential testing can yeah. just use out of the box models like NB or so what people have been using before, or that's, do you need to adapt because of this matching? Yes. No, that's exactly what this, what this basically is. I mean, there's one, one additional thing that could be considered. So far, we didn't do that because we have for this quantifying of new and old RNA, we also have this posterior distribution, which, which gives, us, gives us additional insights into the, how precise the measurement is basically. So this could be included in some future differential gene expression tool for these kinds of data. So far we haven't done that. And what we have used simply is some standard tool. Yeah. Great. Uh, Pait, uh, uh, Pait von Villette, uh, do you want to ask your question or shall I read it for you? Uh, so I can read it. Uh, great talk, uh, would it be feasible to refine uh, generic network based on old and new uh, RNA. Uh, example, all transcription factor new RNA target will be uh, would be the time scale for transcription factor RNA protein uh, and a transcription activation of targets be too far apart. Great question, Florian. Yeah, tough question. I mean, in, in principle, I mean, this heterogeneity sequencing approach that we're trying to push forward is basically a special kind of inferring or is similar to inferring gene regulatory networks because I mean we are trying to infer functional relations between one gene and another gene. For this heterogeneity sequencing approach this is very sp specialized for these uh, perturbations like virus infection but I believe in principle um, it should also be applicable to any other dynamic proce process of changing gene regulatory networks over time. Um, yeah, I mean, th the problem with this, you have your RNA, you have the protein, and basically what we measure is actually not what we would like to see because, I mean, the effector most likely is the protein, and you would like to have the protein um, activity at time zero, so to say. And this would probably not much better correlate with our dependent variable that we would like to pro to predict in the end. This really is a problem, but so far, I believe to some extent, this nevertheless will work because I mean, we have seen examples for that. Yeah. Kirsten, do you want to take the mic? Yes. Uh, hi, Florian. Thanks for the great talk. I have a boring question, but maybe I follow up on the one just before. Um, the problem, I guess, is the, the p-values, right? You, because you do this multiple testing with your heterogeneous approach, so it might be difficult to find out the, the regulations that are in place. Um, is it, would it be possible to measure another time point? Certainly. Um, I mean, 
our approach now is, I mean, the, the key it is right now is super small for this heterogeneity kind of sequencing analysis because we only have 50 cells, which is kind of, yeah, let's, let's say it, it's ridiculous right now, nowadays. But I mean, I think this really will get, it gets much better when we measure thousands of um, infected cells because then the p values are very small in the first place. So the statistical power to identify something is much greater than with just 50 cells. Right. And I guess in the future also measuring more time points would also be something that, that could be included there, certainly. Mm. And the boring question is, do you read out the mRNA decay directly from your approach or is it something you put in from outside? Um, so, I mean, the RNA decay is something that you can basically measure directly if you have steady state cells. Then this due to total RNA ratio is directly related to the, to the uh, RNA, RNA half-life. There's just, there's just a mathematical transformation that you can do. If you have steady state, and if you assume that everything is like dictated by these ODE models that you usually use. In yeah. single cells, I'm not sure whether we can do that because the NTR in single cells is dependent on two things, and that's when is transcription taking place? So when are these bursts taking place? And the same thing is probably also true for, for DK. This is probably also a stochastic event. It is not, a, this is not continuously, continuously taking place. And I believe this would really be difficult to dissect these two things. Great, we have time for a short question, short answer. Uh, Fatma, do you want to take the microphone? I can also read your question. Uh, I, I, can, I can read it so that everyone can, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for giving me a chance to ask this question. Thanks a lot for the great presentation. My question is, um, what is the exact difference for biochemical enrichment-based methods or and single point mutation-based methods in the sense of like heterogeneous sequencing for uh, elaborate on the infection infections? Awesome. Thank you. I mean, in, in general. So the, the old way of doing it before these nucleotide substitution or conversion methods um, were published, the old way of doing it were these biochemical enrichment methods. I think it is, I mean, the, the real advantage of these enrichment methods is that you basically enrich for newly synthesized RNA. So you can go down to like five minutes of labeling actually, and you see newly synthesized RNA. When you would do the same thing, so five minutes of labeling, with the slam seek approach, so conversion, I mean, only a minor fraction, a very small, very, very small fraction of all the reads that you will see will be coming from this newly synthesized RNAs. So I think this is really a matter of which time frames um, are looked at. Okay, thank you very much, Florian.